With the march toward global integration, countries are becoming constituencies, while borders are becoming challenges and also opportunities. The seamless yet curated movement of persons and businesses is needed now more than ever. One man is crossing borders to facilitate this mobility. Recognized internationally as a leader in business immigration law, he is now bringing his expertise to the Philippines. Join me as I meet Jean-Francois Harvey, worldwide managing partner of the Harvey Law Group and our thought leader for this episode. Jean-Francois, thank you so much for joining us on Thought Leaders. Thank you, thank you for having me. You've got a law firm spanning across the globe, three continents, 25 years in practice. But many people just want to understand the basics of how do you get there? And the first question that always comes to mind is, why the law? Um, with this practice, how did you get into this realm? The fact is, my father was a lawyer for 26 or 24 years and a judge for 26 years, so the Superior Court of Canada. So pretty much I grew up. I grew up uh, in, into this field, if you want. My father will uh, so often have other judges coming for dinner and things. So I will be listening to this from a young age too. So when it came to choose to choose where I should go for university and what subject I should take, so I said the easy way out would go to be to go to law school. And uh, it was in fact it was quite fun. It was quite easy actually, <laughs> because I was I was raised in that, right? Yeah. You grew up into the law, so to speak, being immersed in that environment with your father, but he was steeped in civil law. What about the jump to immigration law? What made you shift to that? Well, the easy way would have been to follow in my father's step and continue in civil law and most likely getting all his former clients. But uh, I needed a challenge, I needed something. And immigration, there's a, a very high complexity in immigration law. And also the fact that I was able to help people to, to directly help people, to give them more access to what they wanted, mobility, right? And, you know, facilitate business, but facilitate their life too, about quality of life and all this. That was very attracting to me. Rather than going into a prestigious law firm when you, there were many offers, yeah. you decided to make it on your own at the very beginning after university. Tell me about that. Why the choice to be an entrepreneur? I still remember the day that I, I was swore in as a lawyer. Of course, uh, the law firm with whom I was working, working for came and said, so John, uh, let's do, let's make a deal, an agreement. I said, no, I, said, I just asked them how much you want, how much rent you need for the office I'm <laughs> occupying. The fact that I became, a, the day I became a lawyer, I said, no, I'm going to have my own practice was to give me the freedom to choose as well. And my father did, did suggest me to do the same too. Because, you know, at that age, you have no mortgage, I, had, I was not married, I had no obligation. So I had this, this very short window in your life when you have full freedom to choose what you want to do. And that was my window. It didn't come without its challenges. I mean, everybody setting up a business, let alone a law firm, has the idea of establishing a practice, getting a reputation, getting in clients. How did you manage those first few years? That was, that was tough. The, uh, to be honest, the first five years was really hard. Uh, first, because I look at way too young, you know. Uh, lawyer traditionally have gray hair. I didn't have gray or white hair at that time. <laughs> and I was quite young. I had no background either as how to organize an office. But, and you learn, you make a lot of, lot of mistakes. And some of those mistakes were high, very, very costly, to, to put it mildly. But you learn from it and you grow from that. But now it was a, it was a challenge. I, I, I did enjoy those years too at the same time. And this is why maybe we still are still today expanding and expanding because to open a new office is a little bit like back in 1992, I'm starting my own firm, right? So it's just a, it reminds me this good time, which we still have today. In retrospect, would you advise a lawyer, fresh more tickling, to set up their own law firm? Would you have them go the more traditional route? It's, it depends what kind of law you want to do. I, I think some, some type of law are, are more about practicing every day, going to court every day, and things like that. This you will need more guidance. Where immigration law, by example, is really based on the text, is really based on the book, on the spirit of the law. 
So if you master the law itself, you, you can probably most likely give a very good service to your client from day one. Uh, and one way, one way I was able to make it is by concentrating on result. And it was not easy, but been working very, very hard to get the result that the client was expecting. If you, at the end of the day, you get the visa or the passport for your client, you tend to forget how young you are and concentrate on the result. Tell me about your first case. I mean, it's always, you know, I'm sure you, it's as vivid as today, as the day you actually had it. Uh, not necessarily the first case, but my first very challenging case. I was invited to go to China. And this is how I started in Asia, in 90, back in 93. I arrived in Guangzhou, mainland China, at a time where China is not what it is today, right? And I remember arriving at the train station and having hundreds of thousands of people around me not understand one word, and finally meet the client who was there with a little sign. And that was quite challenging from A to Z, because we needed a translator between us. Mm -hmm. I needed to understand the documentation that was available. And I, I, I do recall losing quite a lot of weight <laughs> <laughs> on this case. So I was able to deliver again on result. So that was, uh, and we were able to help this client to move at that time was in Canada. And of course, a happy client bring you five more clients. Sure. And all that. As to your firm itself, since you were running the firm, the Harvey Law Group, what was your vision then and how have you grown into that since? I love challenge. If I'm not challenged in any situation, I, 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 I get bored really quickly. So as soon as this client in China started and then it was Taiwan and then Korea and of course Hong Kong, this, the challenge of the culture, the challenge of the law itself, the documentation and everything was so motivating that it just came by itself after that. So that the, I, I, I was not able to imagine HLG being only one office. And so I said, no, this is such a potential on this market. All over the world, actually, there's a potential, right? I said, we have to, we have to, to, to reach to that potential. And at the end of the day, the only way to reach a potential is to be there. HLG is, yes, is one big law firm, which is made of, of a smaller firm that are truly adapted locally while keeping, keeping the core, the guidelines. You drill a, a metal steel well, it eats it all up. You made that big leap from Montreal to Hong Kong. I mean, what was it like? Well, first of all, what was the inflection point for you to say, I've got to be in this area, in this region? For those people who move in the early 90s to China and look at it, then you can feel that something was happening, something very, very important was happening. You've been traveling back and forth between Canada, 12 hours jet lag every time, 16 to 18 hours journey, which is not easy either. So that far is the market right there. That's it, far from the family and all this. But you arrive there, you sense the energy. The dynamism, right? The energy. The dynamism, you can feel the energy. That, that was a part of my luck too, to, to, uh, to end up in Hong Kong. I can imagine what it was like in the first few months setting up office, getting a coterie of lawyers together. The challenge is every single day, but you take them one by one. Because if you look at the whole picture and say, what I need to do to set up an office, by example, in Hong Kong, then you just say, no way, close your suitcase and go back home. A small, small step at a time and slowly. And again, I use that, the word luck because for a good reason. So by pure luck, I find the right people too. Uh, the right people was introduced to me. Some of my staff in Hong Kong has been with me for day one. Now you have family, you know, you're growing your family as well. How did you manage that you know, transition to the East. There was some very heavy sacrifice at the beginning of the beginning of my career with uh, regarding to the family. We took the decision to establish in Hong Kong, which was not easy for anybody, uh, either for me or my wife or the kids. But again, step by step. So gradually, we all get used to it, and now they will not want to leave. I guess the question I have is in terms of the outlook uh, of your children, your family, and your staff. I mean, you've got a global city and how do you still cultivate a global outlook for the people you're engaged with? How do you do that? Well, f family wise, I must admit, I have a lot of, I mean, my wife has been a big part of my success and she's from South Taiwan. So that helped a lot. So my, my kids are multicultural too and speak many languages. The kids grew up in Hong Kong, which is an incredible city to grow up in. And like you say, it's a global city. 
so as for business as for family, the, the perception, the, the way they look at the world is totally different. Because again, they're meeting people from all over the world, their friends are di speaking different languages too, themselves are from two cultures. Uh, so no, it's an incredible experience that I would wish that everybody can have. Let me ask you, I mean, you've then gone on a rampage, just going from one office to the other in Asia, South America as well. Tell me, what is your criteria in terms of saying this is the right place to be? I love the good feeling. I, I told you a little bit before, I was by luck, I, I, I was able to witness what happened in China from 93 and on. Ten years ago, I had the same feeling, gut feeling about Vietnam. And again, at those times, people was wondering why I was going to Vietnam. And today, we're very happy to say that we have the lion's share of the market in Vietnam. Because we were alone there for many years. And now we have three offices, uh, Hanoi, in Da Nang, and Ho Chi Minh, of course. So it was a good bet again. You have one law practice, but many jurisdictions. Right. A lot of these change, you either becoming more open and more restrictive. How do you keep that cutting edge in terms of knowing that practice and still delivering the quality of service that you'd like? We're, we have a great team. It's very strong. Daily challenge to stay informed. Imagine we have to deal with so many different law. So of course we have local lawyer in each of the office, but still we have to understand all the local law and the local culture, of course and I have to deal with it. I was giving the example of Vietnam. We sit in Vietnam for one year before getting one client, because we took the time to understand what the country was about, what the regulation was about. So for one year, I was traveling to Vietnam with the team pretty much every week, sit down, talk to people, talk to local lawyer, to accountant, to just everyday people to understand, just to absorb, absorb what they were looking for and what was the challenge. And that's what we've been doing in all the different countries we've been now. As a growing, you know, set of multicultural experts, right. how do you cross-fertilize, take that knowledge, replicate that, and, you know, and, and keep that as a competitive advantage? Well, surprising, I mean, as you know, law is quite a conservative, let's say, call it the business or practice, right? And that's the biggest challenge we have. You have to be so open-minded. You have to be ready, ready to question yourself all the time and question the approach all the time. And to be excessively flexible. The quality check on everything we do is the same everywhere. But at the same time, we have to adjust on what is possible to do or not in a given country. So if you try to, HLG is, yes, is one big law firm which is made of, of a smaller firm that are truly adapted locally while keeping, keeping the core, the guidelines. Yes. We're definitely not a traditional law firm when you look at the marketing we do. It's very rare that you see a law firm doing so much marketing that we do, but it's, it's, it's a, one of the best tools we have for business. Uh, many of my colleagues in other law firms are always surprised to see how, how much marketing we, we, is behind us and say, no, this is this practice, this industry, this field of what we call VIP mobility is, is requests that kind of marketing. That's a very high, uh, high class marketing and all this. But a great, great respect of the local culture while bringing the good from what we learned in the last 25 years. Despite the Skype and WhatsApp and Viber and all the technology today, at the end of the day, you make a deal face to face. And you know, any businesswoman or businessman will tell you that. ongoing, uh, I would say, challenge in terms of finding that fine balance. I want to see how that applies to actually the decision you made to come closer to home to the Philippines. I mean, what were the key points, um, factors, and at the same time, the moves that you had? We had a back office in the Philippines for 10 years, helping us with some of the work we do in other countries. And, but for the last three years, we've been receiving more and more uh, inquiry about VIP mobility, about immigration, about second passport from Philippines. And about last summer, summer of 2016, we really, I really started to think that maybe, maybe we should make a move and open up and open to Manila. So right now, the economy is doing excessively well in Philippines. 
your business community is concentrating on the domestic, but this will, will last a certain time. When business good, very, very good domestically speaking, then the same business community will start to look outside to diversify their investment, diversify their risk also. And because the economy is doing so well, more people have more, more money to spend. Therefore, they will start to look at, hey, what, what, what else can we do? Can, we, uh, can I expand my very successful business in the Philippines to Southeast Asia or to Europe or uh, the Americas? So we feel that it's time for now to, to be, for us to be here. And I'm very happy to say that it was a good decision. Well, so far, and, and, and one of the metrics there you're really looking at is internationalizing Filipino firms and businesses. On the other side, though, there is the thought about you know, the, there is global risk, uh, the rise of nationalism, a lot, a lot of these factors coming in. How does that plays into your solving pain points? Well, uh, you have the same challenge in many other Southeast Asia. And, but the problem is you don't have a good passport. Your passport is very it's hard. Very limited. In terms of traveling, you need visa for many places you need to go, which become a real impediment to business. Despite the Skype and WhatsApp and Viber and all the technology today, at the end of the day, you make a deal face to face. And you know, any businesswoman or businessman will tell you that at the end of the day, it's a face to face meeting. Now that the economy is doing so, so well, those same business people need to travel more. So what we offer them is to make sure that if they do miss a deal, it's not because of traveling, for traveling reason. The environment, however, is changing. You're looking at uh, some borders being a little more restricted than others. Mm -hmm. Political risk is coming up. How do you navigate through that landscape, especially for clients in countries that have increased risk profiles in terms of screening as well? That's why we're coming in too, because we do have, we do have the tools for those clients. We do have the solution, being a second citizenship acquiring a passport which is well, well more recognized and where the system, the, the QC behind that passport mm -hmm. make the host country feel very comfortable to accept this person to come in. The question I have is sustaining that needs a team locally mm -hmm. and back at home in terms of getting the kind of service, quality assurance and others. What kind of lawyer are you looking for kind of special you're looking for and how do you groom them into being the Harvey Law Group uh, you know, um, facilitator and advocate? Isn't it? Uh, a lawyer coming to our firm thinking that the firm will practice as a traditional law firm. We don't count hours, we don't charge by the hour at the office, so right away that's a shock for many lawyers. Uh, we are looking for, to put it in two words, open-minded. We need open-minded people. But we try to specialize each team for certain countries. So, by example, in the Philippines, we're trying to concentrate then more on the on U.S., of course, it's a popular destination. Mm -hmm. And the same lawyer specialized in U.S. in Philippines will go help his colleague in Vietnam for the complex case and all this. So, it's, it, traveling sounds very glamorous and very fun, but when you travel nonstop, it becomes very, very challenging. So, we need people who are willing to, to understand that traveling is not always fun. It's, not, it's always uh, often a last-minute thing. In Hong Kong, most of the staff have a suitcase not too far. And people, it, it's an eternal policy, people need their passport on them 24 hours 7. Sometimes there's an emergency, yeah. next flight is in two hours, <laughs> please go to the airport, the flight, your tickets will be waiting for you, go. The question I have is for you, Jean-Francois, you've seen the world, you're in three continents, 17 offices and growing, what is next for you? We, we're not planning to slow down. Uh, Indonesia is next, of course, and everything. The next challenge, we, we, want, we still want to expand. We still want to expand. Of course, by example, if I take the Philippines, we're in Manila now. But if everything goes well, by the end of 2018, we should have a, a, at least two or three other offices in the Philippines. In the regions, yeah. Because, again, it's a face-to-face -face thing. Uh, when you talk to a high net worth individual about mobility, acquiring a second citizenship, you know, you don't do that over the phone. So if we want to be successful, and Philippines is very particular, you do have many different cultures within the same country. So we do need local people in different cities too, to be that better understand that you have all the dialects and all this, so that we have to respect too. Well, this is a continuing journey. You certainly have globalized what is essentially a local feeling in terms of a service. Jean-Francois Harvey, thank you so much for your time. And thank your you so much for your time again. Yeah, thank you so much. Merci. Thank you.
time and time again, a true leader steps out of his comfort zone because he knows that that is the only way to expand it. He is pioneering in his ideas and deliberate in his actions. Join me again next episode as I explore the minds and the moves of the country's most successful people.